Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and a warm welcome to tonight's series, the 23rd edition of the Emirates NBD Global Business Series, a one-of-a-kind initiative by Intelligent SME. My name is Natasha De Souza. I am a business journalist and presenter here in Dubai. I will be your host this evening, and it's an absolute pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to tonight's very special edition. Since its inception over the last two years, this carefully crafted program continues to inspire entrepreneurs and executives with profound business insights from the most successful leaders and captains of industry in the region. Our success, impact, and reach through this series would not have been possible without the consistent and generous support of our visionary sponsors. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our title sponsor, Emirates NBD Business Banking. our sole automobile partner, Alphatheim Motors Toyota. And last but not the least, our strategic alliance partner, Dubai SME. Now, before we deep dive into tonight's very special session, I would like to inform you that the SPI Group will be hosting the largest innovation conference in the region next week the Global Innovation Summit and Awards. On September the 21st at the Atlantis, you will see at this must-attend event thought leaders, global game changers, and regional innovators convene in one place to explore, debate, and discuss the latest developments that are driving innovation across sectors in the world today. For more information and to register, please visit the URL you see up there, innovationsummit.ae, or speak to any of the members of the SPI group who are here today. Now, without much ado, let's kickstart the felicitation ceremony. I'd like to kindly request our guest of honor, Mr. Shaji Ulmulk, to join us on stage, please, as we commence the ceremony. Now, may I also request Mr. Vikas Tapper, the Executive Vice President and Head of Business Banking, to do the honors. <laughs> Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. I would request now the CEO of SPI Group, Shantanu Fonsalkar, to join us on stage as well. Thank you, gentlemen. I can't tell you how excited I am to see that we have such a great crowd in the room today, considering we just had a long Eid weekend, people might still be in vacation mode, but you're here. You wanna get those juices flowing in your brain, start thinking about, start thinking now about questions we wanna ask our guest of honor. I'm very excited to actually deep dive and I have all these questions planned for you. I promise I will not be difficult. Um, but before that, there are a few house rules I need to share with you just to make sure that today's session runs as smoothly as possible. Um, while we will have time for Q&A a little later in the evening, please feel free to use your phones to interact with us. We have a um, Twitter hashtag. That's the one you see up there, GBS underscore insights. Feel free to use that hashtag, tweet it out if you have any questions, if there's something that our guest says that really resonates with you and you have a reaction, use that hashtag and put it up there. I will be looking at the Twitter a little later on to see if you know, there are any particularly interesting questions that our audience has today. Most of all, ladies and gentlemen, the most important rule today is this is not just my interview with Mr. Almulk. It's not just my conversation. This is your conversation too. You're a part of this. Stir the pot with me if you like. When we have questions, I'm actually gonna get up here in the audience, interact with all of you. 
see what you'd like to speak to him. Imagine this as your living room, if you will, and you're here with this icon in our midst, and he has a story to tell. So let's find out what he has to tell us today. Today we're going to go deeper into the heart and soul of Shaji Omuk. He's here today, not just as an icon, but as an individual. Not just a persona, but a person. A real flesh and blood man who has accomplished what very few can do in a lifetime. Today, we're gonna to go beyond what Google will tell us about him and simply listen to his story in his own words. Well, what do we know so far about him? Nawab Shaji Omulk hails from the royal family of Kurnul in the southern Indian state of Andhra Pradesh. A brilliant student, his excellence as a scholar saw him being awarded the Indian President's Scholarship, which meant that his entire student career, he received a free education. Eventually, Shaji was accepted into the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. And for those of you familiar with MBA programs, this is hands down always among the top 10 business schools in the world. But it wasn't business school that set him on this remarkable trajectory. And we'll come to that in our conversation today. As a founder of Mulk Holdings, a diversified multi-sector conglomerate, his business interests span building cladding, metals, plastics, renewable energy, and healthcare. And just recently, as he told me earlier today, you even have food franchise as well now in the mix. Okay. Forbes has ranked Shaji number 11 in the list of the top 100 most powerful Indians in the Arab world. An Arabian business lists him as the seventh richest Indian among the top 10 billionaires in the GCC. This is a man who has transformed the skyline of multiple continents, Europe, North America, India, the Middle East, Africa, you name it. It would be fair to say that Shaji Ulmulk is part and parcel of so much of the new infrastructure that we see shaping this country, the UAE. But what shaped him? What shook him? Where did he struggle? In tonight's rendezvous, let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me again in welcoming Shaji Omulk. So, you come from Indian royalty, and I can't say I've ever met someone who came from Indian royalty. And I'm curious, you hail from a dynasty called, the, called Kurnul in, in South India. Karnul, yeah. Karnul in South India. And I'm curious, what does that mean to be a Nawab? What was it like growing up in that kind of milieu? Paint a picture for us, if you will. Well, uh, hello, Natasha. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You see, the, your question about the Nawabs is, I think, more of a myth. Now, the Nawabs and the royal family before 1947 was a different scenario. And post 1947 is different. Now for us, there are many stories of the rags to riches and riches to rags. Now as it comes to the Nawab, I have seen personally and many of my cousins who have literally lost everything uh, after 1947. So the very few Nawabs are the royal family members who are smart enough to turn their wealth and the power into businesses. You see, they, in my opinion, the family hasn't moved on. The family needs to move on into reality. Now, what really happened there was they're living in the past and thinking of power, wealth, respect, is a birthright. It's not. Now for me, 
we were happy and I think we were lucky that my family actually uh, put in those values into us saying that it's not your forefathers, it's not your past, uh, it's who you are, is what it matters. So having said that, we had a very grounded upbringing. Uh, yes, the comfort of the lives were there, but then the, my parents never for once made us forget that it's not your past is going to make you. It's what you will be, it's what you will be. So that's how it was here. It was very interesting. So let's imagine, if you will, we're going through um, a photo album. So let's move through. Now this yeah. is um, your great-grandfather, is it here? The... Yeah, that's one of my ancestors, uh, the last ruling Nawab, which is the Nawab Rasul Khan, yes. Yeah. Okay. And then we have here your... Um, That's my grandfather. Your grandfather, yeah, yeah. who no, I believe only. was involved in the freedom and fighting for freedom uh, That well. was the last picture. Okay. Because uh, we were the allies with the Tupac Sultan. Okay. And we fought the British. Uh, so we were one of those families who chose to fight rather than be an ally. And, you okay. know, so we, the family is called the Freedom Fighters of India, basically. Okay. So it's quite actually a, a lofty family history to have, to be yeah. part of a family that was involved in yeah. um, a Latin moving <laughs> India towards independence. Yeah. Let's see here, this is your father. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nawab Alaf Khan. Nawab Alaf Khan, yes. Nawab Alaf Khan. What was he like? My father, as you can see, you know, the man we really were very proud about. Very charismatic, a true Nawab. He, he followed his passion. And uh, I'm very proud of his achievement that he played for India as an international footballer, actually. Okay, so he was, a, he was a sportsman as well? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, because yeah. You, you were a sportsman, we're going to get to that. Yeah, we all that. have inherited his uh, genes in sports, I suppose, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, then I think I have here, your mother is in this photo as well, correct? Yeah, it's a bit dark in the light. It's a bit yes, dark. The whole family, yeah. that's right. Now, was she different from who was more of an influence? I think when you were growing up, your mother, mother definitely, your because my father uh, used to be away, uh, you know, playing professional football in Calcutta most of the time. So mother was the main influencing factor for us always. So she is the one uh, we live with, and all the values came to us from the mother actually. Okay. Any words of wisdom do you remember if she had such an influence on you? Were there things that she kind of made you know, sure what, you always yes, remember? Yeah, that's right. The values I just talked to you about, okay. where uh, she said, it's not the past. You need to be who you are. You, gain, you need to gain respect for yourself, was the mother's words. And that has carried us and our family uh, all the time. Because now, whatever we achieved, is from those values, basically. Okay. Yeah. And three brothers rocking the mustaches. <laughs> yeah, um, that's my young times picture, yeah. Three of us, that's right, yeah. Okay. And you have three sisters as well, so quite a big, yeah, a family of six, yeah. Family. Three, three brothers and three sisters, and they're all here. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think they all look I'm, like? I'm the one in the center. That's me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So tell us, what was it like, I think, growing up at that time when you excelled? I mean, you're one of those few people yeah. that I've met who is a jack of all trades. You were great at academics, yeah. great at sports, and then now, well, clearly, as your you know, success story shows, great at business, too. So where did, were you different in your family in that sense, being able to be good at all these, all these things? I think the combination of a competitive spirit being uh, wanting to be the best was always there. You know, be it studies, be it sports, you're always trying to achieve. And it came from a father who always said, if you do something, you have to be the best. And then there's always this thing, of course, being good at academics is something I think you're gifted. You're a good student, you're not. So that came in. But then there's always this, uh, we're always striving to be excellent in whatever we do. So that's how it went, basically, yeah. Okay. And, um what did you th see yourself doing? I think at that stage, we all visualize careers for ourselves in the future. What did you think you would be doing professionally at that point? Say, is it in your one, 19? Yeah, one thing is very clear in my mind, okay. uh, to be a businessman. 
There was never a doubt. So you knew it at that point? Absolutely. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, hearing the stories of my grandfather, who was a very serious businessman after Monarchy, he actually turned into a businessman. And my father was also involved in the, into the family business. So doing business was uh, always very, very clear for me, not my brothers. My brothers were more into, let's say, one is a doctor, another an engineer, my uh, so you sister. made your family happy because we all yeah. know how, you know, Indian yeah. family yeah. is all about being a doctor and engineer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. that's right, yeah. Okay. Um, now tell me, where did the, I think, the impetus come to, why did you leave India, for instance? So you were, you were, I imagine you come from a well-known family, you have that kind of lineage, you have privilege. So why leave yeah. and, and come to a foreign land? Why? No, that was my, uh, I was getting the uh, visa to the U.S., uh, for my uh, education. Okay, so you applied to yeah, Wharton, okay. Yeah. Because then my sister was here in uh, UAE. Mm -hmm. And then I came here to get my visa to uh, st study abroad, basically. And then when I came to the UAE, it's about a year, uh, passed my TOEFL and GMAT. So the main reason for me to come to the UAE started off being to get a visa to the US so I can go and study. Okay, so this was just supposed yeah. to be a pit stop. You were yeah, going to leave yeah, UAE, yeah, yeah. go straight to you know, right. Wharton, and make it as a businessman after. What changed? Because you walked away from Wharton, and I can tell you hands down, if I spoke to yeah. a mix of folks that I know, anywhere from their mid-20s to mid-30s, who just idolized the idea of going yeah. to business school, the fact that you left mm -hmm. Wharton sounds crazy. Why did you do that? Well, I think that's a bit of a story. You know, I did everything at that time. I mean, it, it mean, uh, got my admission, paid the fees, and I got a letter from my university saying seven days before my flight uh, that you, you know, the university bus will take you to the campus. But then, in a year, I was already into business. and. Uh, uh, by, by that time, what I had done was, had gone into uh, business myself. So in six What kind of business was it? Those days, there was uh, an agency being given by uh, the British company called God Seabits for um, manufacturing uh, ceiling tiles. So I had taken an agency, and uh, so I was all into business a little bit. And then I was doubtful. My cricket captain in those days was uh, a guy called Sundar Chainani. And he was an established businessman here. They are the ones who formed the Rivoli Group and all that here. And uh, so I looked up to him and I went to him and said, look, I'm in double mind. And I've got this flight to take next week for my education. And uh, so I'm already into business. So what do, you, what do you think? He asked me one question. He said, uh, what's your aspiration? What do you want to be? Uh, you want to be a CEO of a large company or uh, you want to be a businessman? That was clear. For me, uh, being in business was a clear-cut option. So I said, no, I want to be a businessman. Then he said, then go. And the, when I went to ask him, my instinct was, I don't want to go. I want to do business So you already here. had made the decision, you just yeah. wanted him to validate it, basically. I think yes. I needed somebody to say yes, my decision is right. But and I just backed my instinct, yeah. So you'd already gotten into business, yeah. ceiling tiles. Mm -hmm. Why ceiling? I mean, how did that happen? You knew nothing about that industry or that particular product, for instance. The business you had at the time yeah. was this agency that manufactured ceiling yeah. tiles. Yeah. Yeah. Something I imagine that you were not very familiar with. So how did you, I guess, become successful with that first endeavor, enough to feel that I don't have to go to Wharton. I know I can be good at this. No, I think it's more of an instinct uh, where you feel confident about what you want to do in life, basically. And uh, thinking, thinking ahead, business is the journey, of course. You know, you get started and then, uh, so at that time for me, doing something small, it was very small setup. I had only Do you remember where people. the building was? Do you remember still? Where, where was it, your office? Oh, in Rashidia, yes. In Rashidia, yes, Rashidia. Yes, okay. in Rashidia, a small setup. And I had only about six people working for me. And, uh, but then I had started, you see, the nothing succeeds like success. So I had 
tasted success. So there was money coming in, the business was happening, and for me, the instinct was I'm on the right path. So I need to continue on that. So you trusted your gut? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just following your instinct, basically. Yeah. So starting from ceiling tiles to where you are now, which is Mulk Holdings, I think, well, this is, uh, well, this is another journey down memory. This That's is a the famous Indian, Indian captain, Azuruddin. Muhammad yeah. Azuruddin, yeah. yes. So here we are, Mulk Holdings. Mm -hmm. You're headquartered in Hamriya. In yeah, that's our head office. Uh, in in Sharjah. Yeah, yeah. All over the world, a valuation that has touching or has probably crossed two billion US dollars. How did that happen? Where, what were the, the stepping stones or the rungs that took you from this company that yeah. dealt with ceiling tiles to this? 